Thank you very much, Ingrid and Nadja. And um, thanks, everybody, for taking time out on a Saturday. This tells me you are committed, ambitious people, and I'm very impressed. Now, I've retired recently, so it doesn't matter much to me whether it's Saturday or Sunday or Monday, uh, but I'm very impressed that you're all here. Uh, and um, as, as Ingrid has said, uh, I'm not a clinician scientist. I am starting by being clear about that. Um, and so I'm obviously not going to try to give you advice about how to combine these two very important and, and challenging roles. Um, but my world as a scientist does intersect with yours in the sense that uh, I've either followed or been succeeded by clinician scientists in, uh, in all of the jobs I've held over the time. And, and that's really because of working in this crossover area of health and medical research that draws on so many different skills in science and medicine and other forms of clinical service. Uh, and also I've worked in research policy, so always in different parts of the public sector, and I expect that uh, most, if not all of you, will spend uh, at least some of your lives in the public sector. Now, uh, Ingrid's asked me to talk about leadership in health and medical research, and, and perhaps for most of you at this stage, you're not really thinking about being a leader. I wouldn't be surprised if there are some of you who are already thinking what's going to be my pathway to have um, a leadership job, but probably most of you are at this stage are thinking about, well, you know, what's the next stage and, and how do I choose my career path? And so perhaps some of what I'm going to say isn't going to seem terribly relevant, but I hope that it'll have some point of resonance for you uh, in how you're thinking about the way each of us can be leaders in our lives every day. Now, I'll start by just saying a few words about my own career path, and, and I certainly didn't set out to become a leader. Um, I chose to do a science degree majoring in microbiology because I was interested in bugs and especially in viruses, and I knew I was not interested in treating patients. So sometimes you just have to know yourself. Um, and of course, whether you want to have patient contact in your uh, work or not, um, a clinical background, a clinical degree in medicine or allied health is a wonderful choice to make because there are so many pathways and opportunities for you to contribute to society in beneficial ways, as well, of course, to have a fascinating life. And research is one of those pathways, and, and I'm delighted to think that many, if not all of you, are thinking about some kind of combination there. Now, chance took me to immunology rather than virology, which was the original reason I did my degree. And so I did a PhD in immunology, and by the time I'd finished that, my ambition really was to stay in immunology research. Uh, and of course, many people who do a PhD then want to stay with what they're doing, and we do uh, sometimes drift off, as I have done over the years. But what fascinated me was the idea of staying always, however good my own research was, I always wanted to be at that frontier of knowledge where you were learning about the newest thing and perhaps uh, in some useful way contributing to it. And immunology then as now uh, was a very fast moving and exciting field. Uh, and so I was very pleased with that, with that choice. And at that stage, I just imagined always being a lab scientist. That's where I wanted to be. I had many years of happy work in the lab. I loved it. Um, I worked, as Ingrid said, I worked in Switzerland for a few years as a postdoc. Then I was back here at the Wee High in Melbourne, and then I moved to QIMR in Brisbane, and always as a full-time um, research scientist and with a, with a growing team. But, you know, chance, opportunity, and, and perhaps a sense of um, wanting to spread my wings led me to start to think about ways I could um, play different sorts of roles. And the first opportunities to do that were really through what you could call extracurricular activities, um, not core job, particularly for me through professional societies and various sorts of committees like grant committees. Um, I was uh, treasurer and then president of the Australasian Society for Immunology, and many of you now or sometime in the future will probably join a professional society, and these are really wonderful opportunities to get to know colleagues around the country and to, to get involved in a wider scene. And as a result of that role when I was president of the ASI, as it was called at the time, um, I then was elected as Secretary General for the International Union of Immunological Societies. Now, Secretary General sounds grand, it's just secretary, really, but uh, it's still a fantastic opportunity to engage internationally 
uh, across to many different societies and meet lots of people. So, I mean, both of those things were really useful experiences and, and what they did was start to reshape my thinking about what my own um, career could be. I then, um, was thinking that way, bit the bullet and started going for leadership roles in my primary job. And the first of those was as director of the Cooperative Research Centre for Vaccine Technology, the CRC. Now this was great for me at this stage because it was really an experiment. It was a half-time role that was based at QIMR, the institute where I had my research lab. So it really meant I could try myself out in a leadership role. I was really worried I didn't have the capability to do it, the strategic thinking, whatever. Uh, um, but still have my research lab and not be giving up that part of my mm. career. And so I was very aware that, you know, I always could have that to step back into. I could go back into full-time research if I wanted to or if at some point I needed to because I made a mess of my directorship job. Um, so as my time in that role finished because the funding for our CRC was coming to an end, um, that was a time of real reflection to think, well, do I go back into the lab full time? Because, you know, I'd always loved that. Um, or do I move on into some other kind of leadership role? And I made the decision to do the latter. And that's when I took up the directorship of the WHO Influenza Centre here in Melbourne. I could talk a lot about what we did in that centre. I'm not going to do that because there are other things to say. But, um, but it was also good in the sense I went on having some involvement in research through an NHMRC program grant that funded a team of us to work on the immunology of influenza here at the Doherty Institute and at La Trobe and Monash. And so it was again a way to be involved in a really interesting leadership job and now in global public health, which of course is fascinating, pandemic preparedness, those sorts of things, uh, as well as still having some involvement in research. The final leadership role that I took um, and which I just finished last year was as CEO of the National Health and Medical Research Council and um, I'll um, come back to that in a minute. And it was at this point that I needed to really farewell my own research career because my research was funded by NHMRC and you can't run the organisation that provides you with the funding, especially if you're working for government. And uh, so that was the time when I had to let go of research as, a, as one of my roles. Um, but, you know, I'd made that, that emotional shift, if you like, that mental transition, and, and I was very ready to do it at that stage. So, you know, having started my, lab, my life thinking, I'm going to be a lab scientist forever, really in the end, the last eight years of my paid career, um, I left that behind completely. <clears throat> now, collectively, um, all of these experiences were, were fascinating, and they gave me experience in or insight, if you like, into a number of things. First of all, collaborative leadership, which I want to say more about. Secondly, what it's like, how to work when you're reporting to a board, as I did in the CRC, or to a minister, uh, as I did with the Minister for Health um, while I was CEO of NHMRC. The CRC exposed me to bridging the gap between lab-based research in institutes and universities and industry, commercialisation of vaccines and vaccine technologies. The WHO Centre gave me insight into global public health uh, and then uh, all of these roles in different ways gave me insight into working with or uh, within government as I did in NHMRC. So, you know, this has been a, a really fascinating um, journey and a privilege at every stage. But these experiences also help me to see that you don't need to be senior or to be a boss of something to be a leader. If we look around, we can see people who show leadership at every level of society uh, and in our professions, might be leading by example, stepping in when somebody needs help, stepping in when something obviously needs to be done and nobody else is doing it, demonstrating integrity when those around them do not. You know, we all have these opportunities probably throughout our lives and regardless of the positions we hold. I think this is really important leadership and I hope what I'm um, going to say about leadership is as relevant to that kind of day-to-day -day leadership in our lives as uh, in more formal leadership positions. 
I think we can also experiment with leadership before we decide whether we want to go for some kind of formal boss role. And that's effectively what I did. I didn't think about it that way at the time, but effectively what I did when I did work with the immunology societies and other sorts of committees, because it turned out to be a big help in mentally taking that step to thinking about a formal leadership role. And then, as I said, the halftime role as director of the CRC for vaccine technology was, was an experiment, a deliberate experiment for me, um, because I was keeping that option open of returning to full-time research if I, if I wanted to. But I think when you make these decisions, um, you can never really be sure whether they're the right ones, because of course you can't do the experiment, you can't follow two paths at once and see there's no sliding doors really. And, and you know, I haven't regretted any of those decisions. They weren't necessarily the best ones, but I haven't regretted them for a moment. Uh, because even though some doors close as you go along, as you move through a new door, but uh, I've had the time of my life in um, each of these roles. So um, just some thoughts on leadership and, and what it means. Uh, excuse me, I'm not crying, I'm just having a runny nose moment. Um, I want to say something about collaborative leadership, which I already mentioned, because um, it's been one of the most um, valuable uh, lessons I've had. Now, leadership implies being out in front, and um, the traditional view of a leader is of a boss. Uh, it's very hierarchical. The all-powerful boss leads an army of subordinates. And traditionally, that's a, a male in the silverback or alpha male um, style. Uh, but I think today we all understand that other styles of leadership are possible and can even be more effective, uh, better for the people being led, more empowering for the people who are being led. Uh, there's a great person here at the University of Melbourne, Professor Amanda Sinclair, and she's, she's written a lot about this. She's written books called things like Doing Leadership Differently and Leadership for the Disillusioned. And uh, she, it's, uh, it's quite, I found it quite interesting to read about these different styles of leadership and how effective they can be. So my first big lesson in collaborative leadership came in the CRC for debt vaccine te technology. Now, this was an unincorporated joint venture. That means there's no legal uh, power within it. Uh, a combination of eight large organisations, three big universities, two big medical research institutes, the Australian Red Cross Blood Service, CSIRO, and uh, CSL Limited. Now, all of these eight big institutions contributed people and resources to this little government-funded centre that I was the director of for some of its life, um, and that centre was intended to set up, uh, develop new vaccines and vaccine technologies that could then go into commercial development. Now, as director of this centre, I wasn't boss of anybody except maybe a couple of administrative staff, so, you know, this is not power. Um, I was responsible to the board of the CRC, where all of the eight organisations had a, a representatives, and also to the Australian government, which was the core funder. And so I was responsible in some way for, for the work of all of the people in the CRC who were actually employed by those eight different organisations. So whatever power I had as director came through two things, persuasion, and mutual agreement amongst all of the parties about what we were trying to do. So a couple of recollections from that time. The CRC supported me to do a one-week live-in leadership course at Mount Eliza Business School down the peninsula. It's now part of the University of Melbourne. It wasn't at that stage. Uh, and there was one exercise in that um, course that stuck in my mind. We were divided into teams to solve a pretty straightforward problem, which was how to organise different steps in a project management plan into a logical order. It actually wasn't that difficult. And I was in a quiet, interactive team, no dominant people in that team. And we just got on with the job, and I think we probably won the task compared with the other teams because we did it really easily and we didn't have any conflict. What I remember, though, is that there was one other team where there were two very senior men from big public companies. They were well-known names at the time. This team did not get to first base. They couldn't even get the first steps of this set of tasks in order. And that's because the two big strong leaders were in conflict and couldn't agree on anything. 
So it was a really interesting, just direct, artificial, but direct example of how much more you can achieve when you have a team of people who treat each other as equals, regardless of whether they are equals in a hierarchy or not. So I think that's, that's a really important lesson was for me about how to achieve something. You don't have to be the standout leader to get it done. Now, the other relevant memory I have from the CRC was about strategic planning, and hopefully none of you yet have had to sit through strategic planning meetings. I've sat through a few in my time, and I think they can be quite um, pointless and endlessly frustrating. And I've also read strategic plans, which have been just so excessively wordy that uh, it's almost impossible to work out what the, the goals and the strategy actually is for the organisation. But what we did in the CRC was much simpler and, and really turned out to be effective for me as the CEO. And that was, you know, we got the board and the executive group together, um, as these groups always do. Um, but we genuinely agreed on what the goals and the activities of the centre were. We then turned that into a very small document um, that wasn't just filed away in a, in a filing cabinet, but was actually the blueprint for everything we did from then on. And this was really, for me, collaborative leadership because we had everybody who needed to have power here, had a voice, we agreed on what to do, and then my job was simply to execute that. I didn't need to persuade anybody to do anything because we'd all agreed to do it already and we just had to hold each other to that agreement. Now, I think that style of leadership suited me well um, because it enabled us to get stuff done without me needing to be a dictator. Now, the second big lesson I learnt throughout these jobs, and it was one I really needed to learn, is that you don't have to have all the answers yourself. It's really, this is an extension of collaborative leadership that I've just described, but, but it was a personal challenge for me because I've been brought up to be self-reliant and I'd really internalised the idea that as a researcher, I needed to demonstrate my independence and it's easy to confuse that with thinking that means you need to have all the answers and do everything yourself. And so I needed to learn that that was actually not the way to be an effective independent researcher, uh, let alone a leader. So obviously decisions are better when they draw on different perspectives. Better still when they're actually shared decisions as we succeeded in doing in the CRC. You're more likely to appreciate the complexities and the nuances of issues if you have heard from many different people about how these issues affect them. And you're more likely to understand how the decisions that you make are going to affect the people around you or the business you're trying to, to achieve. So you're not just relying on your own experience or your own mental capacity, even if you are, as you will be, the smartest person in the room. More heads are better than one, even the smartest head. Now this, of course, is the power of diversity. It's the reason we don't want all power in our society uh, residing in just one group of people, whether it's a single ethnic background, a single sex, a single language, a single socioeconomic status. We're obviously still coming to terms with this in our own society, across government, across business, and, and in our professions. Um, but I have certainly seen in my own work the value of diversity of thought diversity of opinion when you're trying to make big decisions. And nowhere more than at the National Health and Medical Research Council. Now this is a 90 plus years old institution. Uh, as Ingrid has said, it uh, funds health and medical research around the country in our hospitals, our institutes, our universities. It also produces the national codes of research ethics for all research in the country. It produces some health guidelines for, um, for the public and for the um, professions. And it also actually regulates Australian research on human embryos. Now, NHMRC grant funding policies, codes of research ethics, all of these things are very influential in Australia and um, actually internationally. They affect a lot of people, not only in the research community, but in the general community. Uh, and they are really um, highly respected. Now, the power of NHMRC and the reason it mostly does a good job is its council and its committees. Now, nothing could sound more boring than 
council and committees. <laughs> but I think as Ingrid has said, she's seen as a member of NHMRC Council for six years, the power of different voices around the table to provide wise advice to the CEO and then onto the, onto the minister. And so there are many voices at NHMRC, including indigenous voices, business, consumers, the community, as well as, of course, of course the health system and the research sector. And that's really pulling in absolute gold for the, CRC, for the CEO of the NHMRC. And then for some issues, NHMRC goes further and undertakes public consultation. And that means an even wider range of voices can feed into the discussion of issues that affect them. Now, as CEO, of course, you're still responsible. You're still the person who has to ultimately make a decision or decide that something should be taken to the minister for a decision or for their advice instead of just dealing with it internally. And you need to decide when to change policies and all of those sorts of things. So you have to wear the consequences where that doesn't work. So there's no question that you're still in a position of responsibility and authority, and that's what you're paid to do. But it's so much more powerful. You're so much more likely to make good decisions as a leader if you've sought the advice and listened to, to other people. And I think this is, a, this is a message for whatever role we play in our lives, that where we have issues that we need to deal with and particularly issues that affect other people, then having more voices to help guide us in making wise decisions is incredibly powerful and really crucial to a good outcome. Now, the final leadership lesson I want to mention is, again, one that I hope is relevant to all of us every day, and that's about um, courage in the face of risk. I'm not talking about heroism in the way we see, say, in our firefighters and others who who risk their lives to protect ours. I'm talking about the kind of calculated courage uh, to do something we believe in, but that might fail, might not be popular with everyone, might even cost us our job, so affect us both personally and publicly or in our institutions. Now, there's a beautiful book I read years ago called Crossing the Unknown Sea, uh, Work and the Shaping of Identity. It's by David White, W-H-Y-T-E, uh, and he is, of all things, a poet turned management consultant. So he writes a good book. And um, he uses the analogy of a sailing ship out on the ocean. Uh, if you want to avoid danger, you bring down the sails, but you make no progress. To get ahead, you must set your sails to the wind and accept that you will be buffeted by the wind and perhaps by the storms. So I think that's true in leadership. And it's certainly true in life in all of its messiness. Um, when I first joined NHMRC as CEO, a colleague said to me, uh, well, steady as she goes then. I remember thinking, why would I take a job like this to just keep the desk warm and be steady as she goes? Um, so no, I did lead some significant reforms while I was at NHMRC. There's obviously not time to go into those, but uh, changed particularly some of our major funding uh, research funding policies. Um, we discussed those changes, we consulted, we discussed again. In the end, as I've said, as CEO, I had to decide whether to seek the minister's support to go ahead. Some of these decisions were, were pretty scary because we were crossing an unknown sea. Uh, we knew there were hazards ahead, and some of them were visible and you know we could predict them, but there were others that were not visible, the hidden rocks. And under these circumstances, self-doubt swirls around in your head in the middle of the night. You know, what am I doing here? Um, and, and the reforms we made were certainly not perfect. Um, they'll need refinement. They may need radical change over time. But I think it would have been far worse to say, this is too difficult. Let's wait a while longer. It's not worth the risk. And actually, the ship hasn't sunk yet. Um, and so, just to sum up, my message is this, um, I hope relevant to you in all of your different activities and career stages. Think broadly about what leadership is. There are many ways to lead effectively and contribute to society through leadership. Experiment to find your own form and style of leadership. Um, I think this is really a lifelong task for many of us. Collaborate. You'll achieve so much more with others and you'll be empowered by others' support. Seek advice and genuinely consider it. You don't need to have all the answers yourself, but you can draw on others to find a good pathway through. And then when you believe you have found the right course, 
set your sail to the wind and go for it. Thank you. That was uh, wonderful. So many pearls. I learnt lots. Wish someone had told me a whole lot of that a lot earlier. Um, and we now have this open for questions. Have we got someone to come and help with the quest with the mic? Well, I think one of the things that you touched on is very much going outside your comfort zone and making yourself do it. It's much easier for some than for others. What would you say to your younger self now? I know you've sort of touched on this, but just now, if you, you know, for 30. Yeah, well, I, I lacked courage. Um, I was scared to death of the decisions I made, and so the first few big decisions I made, I agonised for months and months about them. When it came to the NHMRC job, I thought, just go for it. Um, so I always think of, I've often shown in talks, a cartoon where a fellow comes up to a um, shop counter and says to the man behind the counter, I want some doubt cancelling headphones. And for me, this just captures, you know, you, you, it's the self-talk that limits you. It's the thinking, I'm not good enough for this. Why should I do it? Or I don't want to take the risk. Or, it'll be too hard. Uh, and just to close off those doubt voices and, and have a go. Um, you know, of course there's a risk that it's not going to work, but um, you know, you've always got other alternatives. And if you've got the sort of degrees that some of you are uh, acquiring, then you'll have a lot of choices about what to do if that first decision doesn't work out. I can shout it. No, 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 we need this. It's, it's been good. recorded too, so I think it's good. Yeah, the question. Um, thank you for sharing your insights. I have a question uh, about how you resource yourself with um, the work that you do. How do you, you know, fuel? How do you avoid burnout? I suppose in all the all the work that is so interesting and all the opportunities that get offered. Yeah, I think everybody has to manage this in their career, and we all have to have times when we are overwhelmed by workload and have trouble seeing our way through because there's just too much to do and we need a break. So, you know, holidays are important. Uh, having, uh, having time out where you don't do work or think about work, for many people, that, or for me, that would be, you know, reading a book or going for a walk or something like that. These are, you've got to find ways to look after yourself and they, they're not necessarily hugely time consuming ways, but it's really the separation to get, give your head and, head and heart some space. Um, everybody has to find a way to do this. This will be true if you're a full-time clinician, a full-time researcher, or trying to do everything. Uh, and um, I think, you know, they're simple answers, but they can be quite hard to implement in the moment. Very hard. Yeah. But should we have other questions? The puppy hand if you have them, we'll get the mic to. Sorry, I hope I'm allowed to ask some questions to speak. In. And thank you for that. It's fantastic. I'm going to go back and watch it when it appears on uh, YouTube or wherever with the recording, because I think I learned a lot to it. I guess mentoring is a very tropical and some would say fashionable word now in uh, life. Did you, reflecting back on things that you've done, leadership studies you've had and your growth towards leadership positions, did you have mentors and how was it and what did you do? Was that, was that important to you in your, in, in your academic life? Well, I think when I was starting out, we didn't talk about mentorship. We maybe talked a bit about role models, and role models were important. Um, and for me, particularly seeing uh, women making a success of a research career, women in the department I was in here at the University of Albano, that was really important. I didn't seek mentorship. I wish I had. Uh, there were people like Fiona, who's now left. She's a mentor to half the country uh, and a huge role model for many of us. And over time, she became uh, increasingly a mentor who I would speak to about decisions and, and various things. But, um, but the formal process of mentorship that uh, we encourage now uh, was not at all part of my, my life. And, and I think it is an opportunity to, to learn something by, by direct mentorship. I think it's a good thing. I think it's so important. And I mean, I didn't even know what a clinician scientist was, to be honest, never heard of it. Just fell into it yeah. by serendipity. Thank you for your talk. Um, you're obviously a successful woman and regardless if you have children or not, I sort of want to ask you 
um, as a woman, which um, difficulties do you think you had um, in your career and more so as a, as a leader? Well, I think, first of all, I didn't have kids, so that's a huge, you know, we come to talk about time management. That was something I didn't need to, to manage, as so many others um, do and have successfully. So that's, that's a simplification. Um, I think that I kind of grew up in a time when I didn't, I didn't have a very high awareness of sexism and the barriers that my um, sex might have create for me in my own uh, career. And so I never really thought about it in, in those terms. And it's more in retrospect when I look at the impact on other people's careers. And while as at NHMRC, and we looked a lot at data about gender and sex and gender in um, success for health and medical research grants, that I really became aware of the gaps that we have there. So in a way, I feel almost like a for various reasons, an observer of this who's been com become convinced by the data rather than by my own experience that there are significant issues here that have to be addressed. Do you need more last questions? No, oh, well, I think you've touched on so many important points here for all of us. So please thank. Yeah, thank you.